Okay, it's time for us to get in motion. And uh, we'll try to finish up the book of Jeremiah tonight. <clears throat> um, Bill is in uh, Sevierville, Tennessee tonight. And uh, he left me with uh, chapters 46 through 52. <laughs> and believe me, <clears throat> it's a challenge. Anyway, looking at, at Jeremiah, I, first of all, I kind of like to know uh, what these uh, names are like. Maybe that's a fetish of mine, but Jeremiah means God casts or God throws. And we see in the book of Jeremiah that the main part of the book is with uh, God casting down the nation of Judah, uh, taking them down and, and uh, allowing them to go into captivity. Uh, Baruch, who was the uh, uh, scribe for Jeremiah, wrote down most of the things that, that Jeremiah uh, spoke. His name simply means blessed. So uh, the interesting thing about Baruch's name was that recently archaeologists digging around in Jerusalem in some of the ruins that were <clears throat> uh, still remaining, they discovered a clay, um, what do you call it, the clay seal, what they would use to press into wax in order to uh, uh, seal a, a document. And on that seal was inscribed Baruch, the son of Neria. Uh, so uh, again and again, we find as archaeologists dig, uh, they find things sometimes relatively insignificant, but things that support the text of the Bible, the things that we read in the Bible. There are so many things that have been discovered that help to support and help us to, to know that we have something uh, believable, that we have a, a text in the Bible that we can look to with confidence because there are these things that keep being found that point to the accuracy of the account in the Bible. <clears throat> well, getting back to Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah, we find him prophesying in four different directions. Uh, about two-thirds of the book is spent in prophesying the fall of Jerusalem, the fall of, of Judah. And uh, <clears throat> Bill has covered that very well. So I'm not going to repeat all that. We'll, we'll talk about it just briefly. Uh, but the second thing that we find Jeremiah doing is he prophesies the fate of Judah's enemies. And we find that in chapter 46. Um, well, actually, uh, let me see. <laughs> uh, we find that in chapters 46 through 50, uh, talking about all of the enemies of Israel and, and what became of them. <clears throat> So uh, the third thing we see Jeremiah prophesying is the restoration of Judah, the restoration of the reconstruction of, of Jerusalem. And uh, so Jeremiah's prophecies are not only uh, prophecies of doom, but also there's a glimmer of hope. When all of this is over, when, when God has satisfied his uh, disappointment with the nation of Israel and with the nation of Judah. Now, when all of that is satisfied, then God is going to bring it back together. And so Jeremiah prophesies about this. And then finally, the fourth thing that Jeremiah alludes to is the coming of a new covenant. So we'll talk about those things and I'll probably have to move right along in order to get through uh, all four of them, but uh, uh, I do need to finish the book tonight since uh, Bill will be beginning uh, with Ezekiel, or, or wait a minute, Lamentations next week. 
Um, so anyway, the downfall of Judah. We look at that and we think, now why is it that God is, is exercising this harsh judgment against the nation of Judah? And that's our specific uh, target tonight. Uh, the nation of Israel up in the north has already fallen. It's already been destroyed. The people have been scattered. Uh, the Assyrians uh, took many of them away into, uh, into uh, deportation and captivity in, in other parts of their empire. And then when uh, Nebuchadnezzar defeats the Assyrians, those people are still out there where the Assyrians have scattered them. But uh, Nebuchadnezzar is basically going to do the same thing to the nation of Judah. So anyway, when we look at this, we think, and uh, I believe one of, the, uh, one of the prophets actually posed the question, how can God use nations that are more evil than Judah to punish it? Well, I think there are, is a reason, and I think the Apostle Paul, when we get to it, will help us to understand that. But these nations that were coming in, uh, the nation of Babylon, the, the Elamites that were with them, the, these nations were ignorant of God's will. They had not been put in a covenant relationship with God. God hadn't revealed himself to them. But Judah, was in a covenant relationship. A covenant, simply a contract. Uh, I agree to do my part, and Jeremy agrees to do his part. We have a covenant, where we have a, a contract. Uh, and yet we see that even on the day, the very day that Moses came down from the mountain to present the law to the people, they were already breaking the covenant with God. And they continued to do that. And God has been patient with them for 900, not 900, for 500 years. He's been dealing with them. Ever since the, the day that they came out of, uh, uh, out of Egypt and, and the law was given to them, they have complained against God. They have followed other gods. They have done practically everything they could think of to disappoint him. Well, if we remember uh, when, when the law was given to Moses, uh, and we're talking about the entire law, the first uh, the bulk of the first five books of the, of the Old Testament. Uh, Moses was told to write it down in a book. But then in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 24 through 26, it says, so it was when Moses had completed writing this law in a book. When they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, take this book and put it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. Well, why did God need a witness against them? Because the day would come when they forgot to look at that book, and when it came time to punish, they might be turning around and saying, but we didn't know, but we weren't warned but you're treating us unfairly. And now they can't do that. Even though the tribe of Levi was the tribe that was responsible for the religious activities of the entire nation, they cannot now use the excuse, we didn't know. We weren't told. We didn't have the instruction we needed. Because, God, uh, because Moses said, take this book. The entire law is written down in that. 
take this book and put it right there on the table next to the Ark of the Covenant. Now, there are people nowadays who try to introduce parts of the Old Testament uh, into Christianity. Uh, one of the popular things is to say, oh, the Ten Commandments, we've, got to, we've still got to keep the Ten Commandments. Where were the Ten Commandments at that point? Those stones were inside the ark. Nobody got to look at them. But that law that Moses wrote, which included the Ten Commandments plus everything else that God says in instruction to the tribe of Levite and to the people uh, of Israel, everything else that God said is written down and placed there beside the ark. So all of it was important. All of it was there to be paid attention to. All of it was there exposed beside the ark where at least the high priest when he went into the Holy of Holies every year had to notice that it was still there. It was his responsibility to keep things in order, to keep them uh, faithful the Levites were responsible for the entire nation for the keeping of the law. All right. We notice when the people of Jerusalem and some of the people of Judah were taken into captivity that the majority among them who went into captivity were Levites. If you, if you check up on, on some of the names that are given, and, and especially when they come back uh, with Zerubbabel and they come back with uh, Nehemiah, those people who come back, just notice how many in that group are Levites. Because they're still responsible for the nation's religious well-being for guiding that nation. You notice when, when Nehemiah w uh, came back, what, what did he do in way of instruction? We well, got them all together. They stood there and, and Ezra read the law to them from beginning to end. The entire law, he read it to the people but then there are a group of people named in the book of, of uh, Nehemiah who, were, who went out and instructed the people how to keep the law. Not only did they know what it said, but they also understood how it was applied to their life. Well, all of that we see and uh, uh, I think we begin to understand why God judged them so severely when they turned away from him. When they went after false gods, they had no excuse. God had given them the word and God in his wisdom had it put in writing. It was there, it was written down. You know, one of the Latin poets sometime before the, <clears throat> uh, well, during the Roman era, early in the Roman era, he said, the things that are, are spoken are lost. The, uh, but the things that are written down remain. And God in his wisdom had his word written down for us. All right, Josiah. Bill talked about him a little bit last week, I believe. Uh, Josiah tried to reform. He tried to bring about a, a resurrection of the 
of the keeping of the law and he tried to get rid of the false gods that were there and the, the pagan shrines that were in Judah. But his reforms, unfortunately, did not change the heart of the people. If, we, uh, if you want to look into that a little more, you go back to 2 Kings uh, chapter 23 and uh, uh, to Jeremiah chapter 52. Those two uh, describe pretty well what the condition of the people was. Those who should have been following God and who had no excuse for turning away from him. But concerning the keeping of the law, even in the day of the Apostle Paul, there were those among the Jews who had become Christians who were saying, well, what advantage is there in being a Jew? What's the profit in it? In Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we see it says, what advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circunc circumcision? Paul says, much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. They had the word. They had the contract with God. They had God's promises. They had God's guidance. So they had no excuse for turning away from him as they did. So I think we begin to see God's reasoning. Here is a people who have been given every advantage, every possibility to do what is right. And even when Jeremiah begins prophesying the downfall <clears throat> of Jerusalem and the downfall of Judah. Again and again and again, he holds out God's olive branch, so to speak, and offers them the opportunity to come back, to repent, and they don't do it. So we can understand when God deals with them harshly. Now, concerning the enemies that God used to, uh, to cause the downfall of Judah, remember uh, Israel is already gone, the northern kingdom, that's a hundred years ago. Uh, they have been scattered. There is no northern kingdom anymore. But the first one that Ner uh, Jeremiah uh, mentions is the nation of Egypt. In chapter 46, the, the entire chapter there uh, is devoted to the uh, explanation of what's going to happen to, to Egypt. And when we look at the history of, of the Israelite people, they have again and again and again <clears throat> turned to Egypt, or at least said, oh, let's go down to Egypt, let's get Egypt to help us, let's... And uh, God has told them, Egypt is a broken stick. If you go to Egypt for help, the broken stick's going to pierce your hand. In other words, Egypt's not going to be able to help you. And they never did. They never did, uh, even when, when the, the Jews or when the Israelites from the Northern Kingdom <clears throat> tried to turn to Egypt for help. It never worked out because it was not God's will that they should go back to Egypt. It was not God's will that that they should turn to that pagan nation that God had helped them to escape once. <clears throat> so in chapter 46 there, Jeremiah explains that the day is coming when Egypt itself is going to be judged. Egypt itself. And you know the interesting thing about Egypt, if you look at the uh, speech that, that Stephen made, it's the only place in the Bible which refers to 
uh, in the original language refers to a different race. And Stephen there says that the Egyptians were against our race. It's the only place where the, where the original language calls the Jews a different race. Usually it calls them a different nation. But the interesting thing there is that if you look at the population of Egypt now, they are not like the Ethiopians, which they were like in the days of Jeremiah. Now they look like Arabs. <laughs> and now they speak the Arabic language. The whole nation uh, has, has moved, I guess you would say. At least they are no longer the nation that they were. They are no longer the descendants of pharaohs uh, ruling in Egypt. Chapter 47, Jeremiah talks about the Philistines. Why were the Philistines still there? Because God had told them when he gave them the land to drive them out, but they didn't do it. So the Philistines had been a plague to them for centuries. Likewise, Moab and Ammon, they're mentioned in chapter 48 and 49. Who were Moab, the Moabites and the Ammonites? Well, they were the descendants of Lot. They were the children of incest. Uh, we know that story from the, back in the Old Testament. Moab and Ammon. Uh, and they too, they came out of a relationship that was evil in God's sight. And they were a plague to Israel for 500 years. They are no more. There is no nation of Moab. There is no nation of Ammon anymore. When Nebuchadnezzar came in, he took care of that. Likewise, Edom. Edom was the descendants of, of Esau. And <clears throat> God blamed them because they refused to let Israel pass through their land in order to get to the promised land. God also blamed them because they rejoiced when they saw the downfall of Judah. They were there saying, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, go ahead. Finish him off. Well, Edom is no more. Damascus, it's mentioned also in chapter 49, the first part of the chapter, or the first, uh, or the middle of the chapter, in 49, Damascus is no longer there as a nation of Syrians. Now we do have a, a modern nation called Syria, but they're not like the Syrians because in 330 BC, when Alexander went into that area, uh, <clears throat> he conquered that for the Greeks. And after his death, it became the, the kingdom of one of his generals. Uh, the, Alexander's conquest was divided up into four parts. And one part of it was the nation of Syria. But the people there are no longer the descendants or there is no lineage of the Syria that existed in the, in the days of Jeremiah. It has been destroyed, it's scattered, it's gone. What's there now is an Arabic speaking nation. What about Kedar and Hazor? Well, we don't uh, know much about them, but we do know that according to a tablet, a clay tablet that was found, that was written by the, uh, by the Syrians. Uh, archaeologists have dug this up. Uh, we found out uh, through that that Kedar and Hazor supplied sheep and 
sheepskins to the nation of Tyre, uh, which at various times was an enemy of Judah. They too no longer exist. They were in the northwest part of what is now Arabia. Uh, we see mention of the nation of Elam, E-L-A-M. Uh, Elam was an ally of Nebuchadnezzar. It is no longer a nation, it's gone. Chapter 50 talks about uh, Babylon itself and how that Babylon too is gone. All of these that were the enemies of Israel and the Is enemies of Judah that God used to punish Judah, they're all gone. God didn't forget the evil that they did. But likewise, he did not excuse Judah for the evil that Judah did. <clears throat> okay, so now we get a little bit uh, brighter picture. Uh, the prophecies that have to do with the restoration of, of Judah, uh, that God is going to bring his people back. He's going to get them back together. And there's going to be a nation there again. In chapter 30, he talks about bringing them back and letting them have the land and the land will be sown with crops and they'll, they'll be prosperous. So there is a glimmer of hope here. These people who are being punished because of the evil that was done and yet they have a loving God who is willing to bring them back and to restore the nation. Ver chapter 31, the, that chapter talks about the restoration of the nation itself. Uh, chapter 32 talks about the restoration of the city of Jerusalem. And chapter 33, the restoration of the covenant between God and his people. And when we look at all of these things, uh, I think we see the, <laughs> uh, well, poor old Jeremiah, we see him in the middle of all of this. He's been responsible for delivering all the bad news. He gets to deliver a little bit of good news, but he doesn't get to stay around and see it come to fruition because some of the people who were alive at the time that Jeremiah was uh, coming to the, uh, the end of his time in Jerusalem, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had removed the king who was, was on the throne, taken him and his ancestors, a couple of them, they had all been uh, taken away and, and gone into captivity in Babylon. But Nebuchadnezzar placed a man named Gedaliah, G-E-D-A-L-I-A-H, placed him on the throne there in Jerusalem as a governor. Well, the Jews got together and they assassinated him. And they killed the... Uh, um, Babylonian uh, regiment or whatever you want to call it that was there with him. They killed all of them. And then they thought, well, let's see now, what's going to happen when Nebuchadnezzar hears of this? What's going to happen to us? So they all fled to Egypt and they took Jeremiah with them. And that's the end of Jeremiah's prophesying in the city of Jerusalem. Now, an interesting side note, if you have time sometime, uh, get on the computer and look up Elephantine Island. Elephantine Island is located in the Nile River. Uh, it's up the river uh, quite a ways. But 
the Jews who went from Jerusalem and immigrated, or, yeah, you know, let's see, it depends on how you spell it, whether it's going out or, com or coming in. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> they left Judah and they went down to Egypt. And uh, at one point, they actually built another temple on the Elephantine Island there in the Nile River. Uh, and the, the Jewish community remained there for many years. Uh, you can look that up. It's a, there will be a history of it on the, on the internet. So it's, uh, it's something that uh, the Bible doesn't say anything about it, but uh, except that uh, this group that was with Jeremiah went down there. All right, so basically we have come to the end of Jeremiah's prophecies and their fruition, which concerned the nation of Judah. Judah now has gone into captivity. Uh, if you want to follow that story, you have to go over to the, oh, to the book of uh, Daniel and see what Daniel is doing there in Babylon. Uh, you can go on and, and read the uh, accounts that are in Ezra and Nehemiah and you can see about the time that uh, Jeremiah had mentioned the restoration of the, of the nation of Judah. You can see that occurring uh, in the time of Nehemiah and Esther. But um, <clears throat> the third, or rather the fourth thing that uh, Jeremiah prophesies about uh, is far down the road, another four, 400 years or so down the road. And if we turn to uh, chapter 31 of Jeremiah and look at the verses there, God said through Jeremiah, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. <clears throat> My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So obviously this is pointing toward a time far down the road, a time when a new covenant is going to be established. And we know exactly when that new covenant was. If you read the, the scene at the uh, Last Supper, when Jesus was there with his disciples and there, and he institutes the Lord's Supper. At one point he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. This new covenant that God is, is uh, bringing to, uh, into being. Uh, Nehemiah, or rather uh, Jeremiah prophesies concerning it. And this is not going to be like the old law. It's not going to be like the law of Moses. He makes that plain. Not like the previous covenant. It's not going to be on stone, but it's going to be in the hearts and minds of the people. If we remember right in the New Testament, that nobody becomes a Christian by accident. We've had it up here on the screen so many times every Sunday morning uh, at the end of Bob's sermon, how that we hear the gospel, and believe it and obey it, go through that process that we talk about so much. You don't be born as the Jews were and have somebody 
telling you as you grow up who you are and what your relationship is to God. Now you have to make that commitment yourself. And I think sometimes we take it far too lightly that when we are baptized, when we become a Christian, we have entered a covenant relationship with God. Under the old law, the Jews were in a covenant relationship because God said, you do what I tell you, and I'll be your God, and you'll be my people. Well, that is a shadow of what was to come. God is still saying, if you will obey me, if you will keep my commands, if you will do what I tell you, then I'll be your God and you'll be my people. It's not like the old law, though. Remember in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, uh, there's a description there of, of, uh, <clears throat> of God's people, of the Christians. And one of the things he says is that they will be a special people or a people of his own choosing in some translations. And it goes on to say they were once not a people, but now they are the people of God. Why is that? Because now it includes Gentiles. It includes those who were not a part of the old covenant, but they can be a part of the new covenant. The old covenant, the law of Moses, was given between God and the Hebrew people. Nobody else was included in that. The Jews, or rather the Romans weren't, the Greeks weren't, the Egyptians weren't, the Elamites, the Babylonians, none of them were included in that covenant. It was between God and the Jews, or rather God and the Hebrews whom God chose when he called Abraham. All right, but the new law this new covenant, it's not like the old one. Now it's open to all who will come, all who will accept. It says, they shall all know me. Do you realize if a Jewish child under the old law, if he had been separated from parents to teach them that he was a Jew. He was simply out here and raised uh, by, a, by somebody else <laughs> and never told you are a Jew. He would still be a Jew, but he wouldn't know it. But nobody becomes a Christian that way. Now I know there are religious groups which baptize children and say that they are Christians. But where do you find that in the Bible? Where is there anything there that indicates that? Instead, we hear, we believe, we obey. All right, all God said there, all shall know me. You hear, you respond, and you're added to the church. But not only that, God talks about uh, forgiving and remembering no more. Forgiving and forgetting. Under the old law, you remembered it again every year. Every year, the, the sacrifices had to be made again. Every year, animals were presented because of the sins of the people. But that went on and on and on. Now, we find this that we read here in 
Jeremiah chapter 31. We find that also in the eighth chapter of Hebrews that the writer of the book of Hebrews repeats that uh, so that uh, the connection is made. They, they understand there. Uh, chapter eight and, and verse nine uh, repeats that whole text that we saw there in, in Jeremiah chapter 31 because the, the book of Hebrews was written to Hebrews who had become Christians. They knew they had become Christians. They didn't become Christian by accident. They didn't become Christian by being uh, born as a, through natural birth into a covenant relationship. They became Christians because at some point they heard, they believed, they responded, and they were added. We see that process in Acts chapter two. Um, Bob has talked about that uh, recently in discussing the, the book of Acts in this congregation. So what we have uh, here is something that Jeremiah prophesied something that we have inherited, a great blessing that we have, this new covenant in Christ, paid for by the blood of Christ, a sacrifice that was presented once and never needs to be presented again. Uh, we, we could also the, go through that in the, uh, in the book of Hebrews. Uh, not only does it mention this new covenant, but also we see the whole process in the book of Hebrews. And so I'm beginning to run out of wind. <laughs> oh, we've got six minutes left. Are there, are there, is there any discussion or any questions? And, um, and uh, Uh, it's in um, Acts 7 uh, and verse 19. Um, the word used there, uh, he says the, the Egyptians mistreated us because of our, uh, I think the translation uh, says people in, in one translation, it says uh, race in some translations. It's the word genos in, uh, in Greek. Genos uh, refers to a, a race. Um, but in most cases where the people are referred to, uh, they're simply called the nation, uh, ethnos. No questions, <laughs> no comments. <laughs> we got uh, five minutes and 35 seconds. When I, when I look at these Old Testament characters, especially uh, uh, Jeremiah, all that he suffered, uh, how that they mistreated him uh, simply because he was telling them something they didn't want to hear. And uh, I think uh, sometimes we uh, look at our own situation nowadays and you try to, to talk to somebody about Christ and they don't want to hear it. They would rather you just didn't bother me with it. Uh, and we see that human beings haven't changed a whole lot over the centuries. When Jeremiah went in to tell the king uh, I found the law, or, or we've, we, we have the word of, of God. Uh, it's written down here on a scroll and the king tears it up and throws it in the fire. Um, we shouldn't be surprised to see that there is resistance. 
you know what happens when you talk to someone uh, about what they believe and you point out that it's not what the Bible says or that it's, that it's not according to, to what, you, what you see in God's word? What happens to the person? You take away his security. He's already convinced himself that he's all right, that everything is fine, that my relationship with God is just rosy. But when you start chipping away at that with the truth that's in the Bible, a person naturally becomes defensive. That's part of our nature. So poor old Jeremiah, when he went to the officials and said, <laughs> well, here's what the Lord says. You better get ready because it's coming. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. The city's going to be torn down. The temple's going to be raised. They didn't want to hear it. And I, I hope if there are degrees of reward in heaven, I don't know that there's any indication that there is, but if there is, I hope there's a good reward reserved for Jeremiah because he went through a lot just trying to tell the truth. Okay. Any other comments, questions? If not, let's bow together and be dismissed in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the examples we have of, of individuals, both those who were faithful and those who were unfaithful, that we might be able to understand uh, what it means to be your people and what it means to, uh, to wear your name. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity for forgiveness, the opportunity for forgetting that we are sinful people, for the guidance that you give in your word so that we might grow spiritually, so that we might develop into a proper and useful servant for you. We thank you that you have loved us even when we're unlovable, that you have prepared for us even when we don't deserve it, and that we have hope through Christ. For we pray in his name, amen.